Hey folks, this is Evangelist Mike McCurry. I am here with Pastor Rich Haley Jr. And I'm excited to have him on the program. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you, Pastor, to give just a short synopsis. Take as long as you'd like, but 100 to 250 words or so, a couple of minutes. Tell us about how you came to maybe know the Lord in short. Give us your testimony, because I think for our listeners and to my shame sometimes, I gloss right over possibly, really, the most important aspect of our Christian walk. And so to give people a little, a little introduction to who you are, Pastor, tell us a little bit about your salvation and what brought you to where you are right now. Amen. So I'm, uh, like I said, I'm Pastor Richard Haley uh, here in Wichita, Kansas, and I uh, started out, my dad is a pastor in Hutchinson, Kansas, and so I grew up uh, in a pastor's home. And, you know, so that's kind of where uh, I began, of course, to know the Lord, to hear the Lord at a very early age. I know not everybody has that privilege, but I had the privilege to get to grow up in a Christian home. And so my dad, uh, being a pastor for a lot of years, uh, of course, the, down, uh, the, the downside to growing up in a Christian home is that you sometimes uh, miss the things that are most important, which is salvation. And you just kind of get into the spirit of the church and what your dad does. And you don't really, you know, think about yourself personally. So it wasn't until uh, I was at uh, camp one year where the pastor was preaching and going over, you know, the, uh, you know, the gospel that I was sitting there listening. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, you know, I, I've accepted Christ as my savior because that's, that's what the Bible tells us is the way to heaven, of course, accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And I was like, well, I, I, I've surely done that. I'm a pastor's kid. I've grown up in church. I, I've done all, I, I do all these things. I was like, surely I've done that. And so I remember sitting there thinking, and I was like, let me go back and let me remember when I did that. And I remember being there at camp and going, I, I don't remember when I did hmm. that. You know, I just kind of, you know, it's just kind of that first moment of self you know, reflection, you know, you just all, you just for the first time kind of look inside yourself, you know, you get so busy in a pastor's home, kind of just doing everything that pastor's kids do. And so then when I finally kind of reflected in myself and thought about that, I was like, I've never accepted Christ. So, and I knew how to, I knew the gospel, I'd given the gospel, uh, you know, I've heard it a million times. And so I knew, you know, everything I needed to know, I just needed to accept Christ. So I turned around and I knelt in my chair there and I accepted Christ as my savior and I remember asking Jesus to come to my heart and saying, I've never done this before. So, Lord, I need to get this settled. You know, I need to take care Amen. of it. Except the Lord is my Savior. I didn't tell anybody because I knew I knew what to do. I just turned around in my chair and asked the Lord to come to my heart and save me. And so it wasn't until a lot later that I got baptized like you're supposed to because I just I just knew. I was like, okay, I got to get saved. And so I need to get saved. And then that was it. Just, just me and the Lord. And so, uh, but that was when I first came to know the Lord as my Savior when I finally realized for myself. Hey, you need to know Christ. So, Absolutely. I think there's a great application point that can be drawn out of that for a lot of our listeners. So many of them, and, and I get notifications all the time. I actually spoke to a gentleman yesterday that listens to us on a, a VCY up in Wisconsin area and people, WVGV, Brother Ray's station in West Virginia and WGV, just all over the place. They listen to great Christian programming, but they've never accepted Christ for themselves. Like yeah. you, they know what the right answers are. And if you ask them about heaven, if you ask them about hell, if you ask them about what a Christian walk should look like, they could give you the verbatim, biblical, the right answers, but they've never, as you did, knelt beside a chair and asked Jesus to become their personal Lord and Savior. And so I would encourage those that are listening right now, I would absolutely love to hear from you. Now, I've mentioned this many times, and I'll say it one more time, that there is a way, you can, there's multiple ways that you can get a hold of me directly. You can text me at 309 316-7240. I'll give you that number one more time. I said it kind of fast. 309-316-7240. And for those that are listening, please don't be shy or gun shy about contacting me. I've had hundreds of people as a result of the radio programs and podcasts that have reached out and said, hey, could you be an accountability buddy for soul winning? Could you tell me a little bit more about salvation? I've had people let me know they've gotten saved as a result of the program, and that's great. But here's the problem. For those that are listening right now, and Pastor, you know this, someone else's decision does nothing for you. Okay. You, growing up in a pastor's home, that didn't help you. You had to make the decision for yourself. And so I appreciate the fact that you kind of drew that out and the fact that we all have to come before Christ and make the decision for ourselves. So 
as a young man, you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you get baptized, and then what are the next few years like for you? Because, not to let the cat out of the bag too quickly, but you got in the pasture very quickly. The Lord allowed you that opportunity, and I would say, being in evangelism uh, as a somewhat young man, I guess, for about a year, there are not, unfortunately, again, there are not many men your age and mine that are in the pasture. And so talk about the journey to uh, God leading you that way. Well, I would say, you know, I, you know, again, it was a privilege to grow up in a pastor's home. Uh, and some, you know, unfortunately may not, you know, may not always see it that way. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed, you know, growing up in a preacher's home. Uh, my mom and dad, you know, also they, they, they made it fun. They made, you know, living in a preacher's home a, a great time. So I got to, I got to do a lot with my dad because that's what my dad kind of wanted me to do was, you know, he wanted me to work with him alongside him, not him be a pastor. And then, you know, I, I was, and then I just kind of sat by the wayside kind of thing. Uh, so I really got to help my dad in a lot of ways do the things that a pastor does. So I got to experience pastoral work at a real early age too. And so you know, what, what really helped me was, uh, you know, going into, you know, after graduating high school, I had a lot of real life experience because I helped my dad in a lot of areas of what pastoring is. Um, I, I went and made hospital visits with him. I helped him do some, some limited counseling. I helped him, you know, go soul winning. We were soul winning partners. We, you know, I helped him do the, the functionality of the church. Uh, growing up in a small church, uh, there was always not a lot of help. So, as the oldest son in the house too, I pick up the brunt of the work of the church. And so I helped dad, you know, in anywhere that he need possible, he'd say, Hey son, I need you to fill in for this. I need you to fill in over here. I need you to teach a class over here. So I taught classes uh, at a, at a young age, things like that. And of course too, there was that aspect of reading my Bible and spending time in prayer for myself. You know, I grew spiritually as well. That doesn't, you know, take away from the fact that I came to know the Lord as my Savior. So I, I, I loved the Lord too, and I wanted to serve God. And so I was looking for how I could be a service to the Lord. And so the, uh, so between God and my dad, uh, allow, you know, kind of putting me in these areas that allowed me a lot of experience. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. And so I got to do a lot. So by the time I did go to Bible college, uh, I had already had a lot of experience. I'd already done a lot of things. And then of course my focus you know, the Lord allowed to kind of be honed to where I knew God wanted me in the ministry. I had had a taste of the ministry. I had seen it. I knew what it was about. I knew that was for me. I knew that's what God wanted. Now, where and how, what and why, I didn't have all that figured out. I just knew at a young age, I loved ministry work. I loved the Lord, and I wanted to be a part of that in a big way. God had, you know, through messages, through my Bible reading, through my personal walk with God, it was, it was clear that's what God wanted me to do. And so I had that benefit, you know, I, I, I just, I knew that, you know, and again, I didn't know where all that would lead, uh, but I just, that was kind of those next few years. It was me spending time in my Bible, my dad seeing as my father, my pastor, the spiritual growth and the desire to do that and get alongside and help him. And so he would plug me in any chance I would get. I mean, I preached uh, a couple of times for my dad as a teenager in the church. I got to, uh, you know, just do a lot of things that really helped me. So by the time I was ready to take the path or when somebody called me to be a pastor, I really had that, a lot of that experience. And I think that's a big thing, you know, because when you look at years ago, even for our savior in the Bible, you know, at the time he was 12 years old, he said, I must be about my father's business. And I just kind of had this desire as a teenager that if, if the Lord as a teenager was about his father's business, doing something, getting busy, then why not I as a teenager? And so sometimes we kind of gloss over the teen years and think that's just kind of the time you can break and have fun and not really do anything. Uh, where my dad really helped me just to get busy and get focused. So by the time I became a young adult and somebody needed a pastor, I was ready and prepared. I didn't have to go back and make up for all the teen years that I wasted. Um, and so that really helped me too, you know, having, having a dad to, to kind of guide me into that as well, because I would have just probably blown my time if I, if I wasn't careful. And so dad really helped me and get busy and get a work ethic, get some character. Uh, and so I just served, served the Lord in Hutchinson for years, filling in everywhere in a small church. And that was just, you know, it, that really gave me the life experience that I needed. Amen. It's amazing to hear how God can use 
continually, not just in the Bible, but that Paul and Timothy relationship, even though yours was by blood. But I think it's an inspiration to me as well, hearing how your dad kind of counseled you and worked with you and got you busy about the father's business before you even realized maybe what he was doing. The opportunity, though, the inspiration is for you and for me to replicate that. Because if we're not reproducing, we're going to die. The, the, the human race has survived for many thousands of years because God said, go forth, you know, be fruitful and multiply. But that's not just a physical thing. That's on the spiritual as well. And I think important, you know, to note maybe for your listeners too, a lot of people, uh, when my dad and I have been together and we talk about, you know, being pastors, you know, a lot of people that maybe are not familiar with how the Bible works with this area, they think, oh, you're just a pastor because your dad told you you're going to be a pastor, you know, that this is, you know, the fan, kind of like a family business. They think that, you know, your dad's a pastor, he's got connections, so he kind of gets you in, you know, and, and that in the, in the, uh, in the business world, that, that is somewhat how that works. You know, if your dad is a contractor, you grow up with that experience and being a contractor and that he kind of gets you in or gets you in his business or you start your own business. And that, and that's not a bad thing that that does that in the business world, but in the spiritual world, when it comes to the Bible way, of preaching and pastoring, you don't get in this business because your daddy gets you in. Now, there are maybe some that do start that way, but that doesn't last. If you're not God called, it will never last. And that was important, you know, that I always explain to people that this is something not that my dad called me to do. It is what God called me to do. I knew in my heart, God wanted me to be a pastor. And I was thankful for my dad. He never pushed me to do that. He said, son, if God wants you in the ministry full time, I'm excited. Or if God just wants you to be faithful and serve somewhere and work a job and, and just sit in the pew and help a pastor, I'm excited for you too. You know, he never said, this is what you're going to do with your life. You know, you're going to be a pastor. You're going to do this. This is my, you know, it wasn't my dad's vision for me. It was what I knew God had did in my heart. And then I could tell my dad and say, Hey dad, I know God's called me to preach. I, you know, I surrender to preach. I know what God did in my heart. And then my dad would help me from there and say, then I'm excited for you. This is what you need to start doing. Then if you believe God's called you to do something, you know, so, so important to understand that this is, you know, in the, in the realm of what the Bible teaches, I didn't get into this because my dad told me to, it was what God told me to do. And that's, what's going to keep me doing it because I know God's called me to do it. Not, you know, mama said, Hey, you get to do this, you know, so that's right. so important for people. To understand. I appreciate you doubling down on that. And I'll, sh I'll share a personal anecdote as transparently as I can. I've said so many glowing things about my, about my parents and th this is not a, a diversion from that, but there, I had a moment when I was about 17 or 18 years old, I was facing a pretty large spiritual decision. And I had been praying about it, thinking about it and trying to get the mind of God about it. Because as you said, I knew if I did not make the decision with God, with God's help, and it, it, it was something that was forced upon me by my authority, whether it be parents, pastor, regardless, then it wouldn't stick. It would be something I would be even resentful towards maybe as we got further on. Yeah. And so uh, the Lord settled in my heart. I won't get into details, but the Lord settled in my heart exactly what God had for me. And then somebody, uh, a friend of my parents, asked my parents, so why is Micah doing such and such instead of the other? There are two, two main options. And my parents gave all of the logical reasons why this was the direction we went. And to be honest with you, I was kind of privy to the conversation after that person left. I wasn't in no way disrespectful. But after they left, I said, Mom and Dad, hey, I just want to let you know, it, it, honestly, it stirred up just a little bit of irritation in me because I said, Mom, Dad, the final reason? is because God wants me to. Yeah. The logic of the situation has nothing to do with it. And I knew that's what God wanted me to do. If he wanted me to go to A, I'd go to A. If he wanted me to go to B, I'd go that way. And so I think it works both ways. Yes. Oftentimes, we kind of just kind of run in circles doing nothing or just sit still doing nothing because we don't have a, a strong spiritual leader that yeah. will uh, tell us what way, which way we should go. But on the other side, when you do have a strong, and if I can say at times, it can be an overbearing spiritual leadership in your life. At some point, you're going to have to get alone with God and you're going to have to make the right decisions because your dad could have wanted you to go on the pasture. And maybe that's not what, what God wanted for you. And thankfully you followed that and you've been uh, in the pasture now for how many years? Uh, I've been a pastor. It'll be six years in March. 
Amen. And I, and I, I also want to preface this next question by saying the numbers are not in any way the final result, the final litmus test of success. But tell us, if you would, how, where the church was when you took it and where it is now, even in the midst of a tumultuous year and on the tail end of a tumultuous year. Uh, tell us where it was and where it is now. Amen. So, well, like you said, I, I like to kind of go back to sure. know, numbers don't mean anything. Uh, if anything, I learned from my dad, he's been a pastor now uh, for 25 plus years. And if anything, I learned from my dad, there's lots of ups and downs uh, in the ministry. It's it's faithfulness. That's the key. He's been there for all these years and seen God, you know, bring them through a lot of the valleys, uh, more more valleys than there are mountains. <laughs> you know, so uh, so uh, you, you think it would even out because for every mountain you think there'd be a valley. But somehow we end up with more valleys than mountains yeah, sometimes. Yeah. So. Um, so, I, you know, some numbers don't mean anything, but it does. I, I, I do. I do look, I look forward to the day that I can say, you know, I've been there 20 plus years because that's really, you know, faithfulness is the key. But Amen. where the Lord's allowed us to be when I took the church, there were uh, about 12 to 15 people. Not all of those even members of the church. Uh, the church had kind of gone through a little bit of a split and uh, uh, and just kind of some things that happened from the pastor before me. So. What happened before I took the pastorate, I was filling in because the church is about 45 miles from where my dad pastors in Hutchinson. And so I would drive about 45 minutes, you know, to an hour to help fill in because Brother Houston, that's here, the evangelist that's in the church at the time when the church, when the pastor left, he kind of took over to help the church find another pastor, kept the church together. I really believe if it wasn't for Brother Houston, the church probably would have ceased to exist because he really mm-hmm. kept people together. Uh, keep spiritually feeding the people, trying to find somebody and bring in a pastor. So he called my dad and said, Hey, do you have anybody uh, that can help fill the pulpit, you know, just till we find a pastor? And so my dad was like, sure, my son, I had just been back from Bible college a year, you know, I hadn't even been back that long, you know, so it's amazing God's timing, you know, when, uh, uh, how, how that the Lord works, you know, had I been born uh, any, any later, uh, this wouldn't have worked out, you know, I mean, it's just amazing how God works everything. And so he was like, sure, my son can fill the pulpit and I'll send him down. So I would, for about three months, I'd just come down every so often on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, just whenever needed. And I would preach for the people. And so we developed kind of a relationship with the people here before I ever became a pastor. You just kind of talk with people, love on people, try to be a blessing, you know. And so they would bring in a pastor and he would preach and they would vote on him. And it would just kind of be like, no, that's not the guy. And then I'd come back and preach for a little while. And then they'd bring in somebody else and they'd vote on him. And they're like, no, they don't like, you know, because there's that relationship you get where, you know, this is who God wants. So I did that for a while. And then finally, somebody was like, we really like that young guy that's coming. And uh, they're like, why don't you bring him? And and, uh, so Brother Houston called and asked me and I said, no, I do not want to come pastor. I was like, I am not ready for that. You know, I was like, I, I want to, I'm happy where I'm at. I want to stay here. I want to do all that. I was like, no. And so, uh, you know, long story short, he called again and they asked again and through again, my Bible reading, my personal walk with God. And then my pastor, even though he's my dad, uh, and through my pastor, it was like, yeah, this is where God wants you to go. You get, you gotta go. In fact, I tell you just kind of how it happened to my dad called me, uh, cause I was reading my Bible when, you know, Joshua took over for Moses mm-hmm. and, so the Lord kind of started working my heart because I, I told him no. And he was like, you know, how, how old do you have to be before you're ready? And I was like, I don't know. I thought 30, you know, and uh, and God said, well, I said that you're ready. You need to go. And so I was like, OK, so I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about that. Uh, Joshua taking over a young man for Moses that had has dead and gone and the people got to be led. Otherwise, they're not going into Canaan. And uh, and the question that really got me was the Lord said, are you going to let a church die? because you didn't feel ready you know and I was just like okay that that hurt me right there and then my dad calls me and says son I'm your dad I love you I want to keep you but as your pastor you need to pray about going he goes because God won't leave me alone about it so again I love that relationship my dad had with me to say I would rather keep you but I can't be selfish it's God's will not my will so I was like okay we'll pray about it and he goes if they call Monday at nine o'clock you need to go candidate i said okay i was like that'll never happen you know when does that happen you know i was like nah that's all right yeah sure i was like all right i'm safe monday that's not gonna you know put a date on time on it like i'm safe and so i was you know praying about it and so monday sure enough 8 59 nothing monday at nine o'clock brother houston called my dad no joke at nine o'clock 
I was sitting there and, and that's just when, you know, you're like, okay, all right, Lord. Uh, hands up, it. hands up. Yep. Even, you know? And so uh, I came and I candidated, I passed her, uh, I preached a, a sermon. I had already preached, you know, probably you know, seven or eight, nine, 10 times before, but I came preached and uh, they voted hundred percent. So we just stepped out by faith and there was just about, like I said, 12 or 15 people. And so I said, we'll just get in and, and, and be faithful. And the church was, you know, probably two or three months from financially having to close its doors too, because mm. it just, you know, there was, there was so few people coming and just kind of what, where do we go from here? So I just came in and took over and uh, you know, just like went soul winning because that's the lifeblood of the church. That's where you start with and just knock on doors. And uh, I learned a long time ago from my dad that if you want God to meet the needs, go win a soul and let God pay the bills. And so, you know, we, went soul winning started preaching and just i can't explain it but you know god meets the needs and and people started coming it was neat how when i first took it as well we couldn't pay some of the bills and this person that i don't know how they knew the church or, or where they were from they never came to the church except one time uh they would send uh a check every month for what the bills were needed to kind of make up the bills until financially we got to a place where we could pay the bills that check came in every month once we kind of got to where the lord had brought in more people and we could pay our bills with what the tithes and offerings of god people that check stopped after that point but until then every month that check came in from that individual and uh, they just I, and I just i don't even know again like how they knew the church and and, and what where they got a heart to do it but they just would send that every month. And so God met the need. And so now five years later, you know, we're at, uh, on a good Sunday, you know, uh, close to about a hundred kind of before COVID hit, you know, that we were getting a little bit over that. And, uh, but now it's, you know, on a good Sunday when everybody's faithful and, and things like that, and we can, and we can all meet together. It's right, right around that hundred mark, 90 to a hundred. And, uh, and then our Sunday nights are uh, right around the 80 mark. And then, and then Wednesday nights are 75, 70, uh, you know, things like that. So and it's, a, so it's been a big blessing. Um, the Lord really, you know, built the church and, and, and added people as he sees fit. And it's not, we're not a huge church, you know, but it, the Lord has taken care of it to where people can see that God's involved, you know, God's met the needs, God's brought people uh, uh, to help. And, and you just have to sit back and just say, wow, you know, because as a young man, you know, we've heard the stories of the past of these preachers hearing God do all these things. And so I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I, I don't want to talk about the stories. I want, I want to be in those stories. I want to mm. know what it, that's like. And so I can sit back and say that it's been amazing to see God just bring people, you know? And so we have a mix of people where God has brought people, moved them here and they found our church and people. We per, I personally led to the Lord, discipled and, and seen them saved, baptized, discipled, and then get in and get involved and get going. And uh, it's just been a phenomenal thing. And it's all God. You know, the Bible says, Amen. God says, I will build my church. Because I tell people all the time, I don't know why people would come to a church I pastor. You know, like I, <laughs> and I, I'm only 28 uh, years old, going to be 29 in January. So it's like, why would somebody want to come under a younger preacher? And it's only because God made it clear to them, this is where I want you. Because I don't have a whole lot to offer at, as, as far as age. You know, but I just preach the Bible and people come and they're like, we know that's where God wants us to be. So you got to love that. Amen. Now, and you just mentioned, so 28 now, 29 in January. Yes, sir. So you were how old then when you officially accepted the call? I took the pastorate at 24. And Amen. so we, yeah, it'll be 26. Uh, well, I, I, I wanted to let people hear that because going back to the, the history of Bible Checks Incorporated, Dr. Paul Levine, he wasn't doctor at the time. But yeah. he started in full-time ministry as an evangelist before he was 19 years old. And yeah. one of the things I love is the fact that he was he was called the boy evangelist. Now that became, in his later years, he was called the dean of evangelists. And so obviously he grew out of the boyhood a little bit. But yeah. in all seriousness, I'm glad to know that we still serve the same God. Now, and I'm 28 myself. And just a cool anecdote is that um, I yielded to the call to preach at the same time at the same camp that you had made some some big decisions as well in yeah, your in your yeah. teenage younger years. And that's just a cool connection there. But one, you can see the the graciousness of God and allowing uh, us to serve alongside each other, even though geographically separate. That's amazing. But I would like to point out to the listeners that that does not have to be 
some some off the wall story or some unusual anecdote of seeing a 24 year old go into the pasture or a 28 year old evangelist and i'm nothing special by any stretch and you would say and you would say you would say the same for yourself yeah. but all we are are we're maybe young but we're usable that, that's yeah. all we ask for god to do with us is to use us to make us available yeah. when I, and so for those that are out there go ahead all right when i when i when i wanted when i looked at pastoring i was really nervous and so I called a bunch of other preachers. And it's funny how if you talk to the older generation, uh, and we don't really know that because we don't really hear maybe some of those stories, but a lot of older preachers started pastoring 23, 24, uh, some younger. And so you find out that God's used young men a lot of you uh, since, since David, since, you know, all right. of, the, of the Bible, you know, God is God uses young men. And so I, you know, kind of came to the conclusion, it's not about my age, it's about my character, if I can get in and do the work, you know, and then that's where, you know, Brother Houston was a blessing too, you know, when I came to take the pastor, he told the men, he said, hey guys, you know, he is young, he said, but some of the men in the church are businessmen, he said, how old were you when you started your business, mm -hmm. you know, and they were my age, you know, how old were you when you, you know, you did this, you know, and you, you were a manager at, of this stuff, you know, and, and, and they were around my age. So I began to realize, you know, sometimes we kind of put in our mind, well, I need to be 30 years old and I need to have right. five years as a youth pastor and two years as an assistant pastor. And we kind of put, you know, uh, a, a time frame on what we think God's will is, where God just says, it's whenever I say so. And I just need to have my character in order to where God can use me and plug me in wherever that God wants me to be. And so, right. you know, and, and like you said, it's not because we're anything special, but it is because God needed somebody. And that's what really got me was it was it was God saying, I'm not asking you because you're the greatest preacher. I'm asking you because there's a church that will die if there's not somebody willing to go to go help that church. You know, and that and that I couldn't I couldn't do. I couldn't just allow a church to die because I told God I wasn't ready when God knew mm -hmm. it's not your age, it's your character. Go win souls, read your Bible, pray. And he'll do the rest. So, right. Yeah. And uh, I would probably sum all that up in saying, don't compare someone else's chapter 37 to your chapter three. Right. It's just not wise. And one, comparing ourselves amongst ourselves is not wise. The Bible lays it out very clearly. Um, but comparing where some senior pastor has been for many, many years and thinking that's the ministry I'm going to have within the first 12 months, you're just setting yourself up for disappointment. Right. And so you, you mentioned his name again, and I, I would really like to highlight uh, evangelist Ted Houston. I'd like to talk about him for just a second. And I, and I see a great parallel between you taking the church with evangelist Ted Houston. There has been a past. He was in the pastor for, I think, over 20 years and yeah. now in evangelism for many years. And I took the ministry of Bible Checks Incorporated. God gave it to me for my predecessor, Pastor Mark Smith, now a pastor in Pennsylvania. But he was in the leadership, the director of BTI for over 15 years. And he had been in the pastorate for 20, 25, 30 years previously. He was 66 years old when he stepped down. And so I'm taking over this ministry and in the best way I know how with the grace of God, trying to lead on softly and make the transit. Now, thankfully, and I think you would say the same thing. My predecessor made the transition so incredibly easy. And I think Ted Houston did the same for you and even still does. Still six years later, a member of your church, a seasoned man of God. And I'll just say this very quickly before I turn it back over to you to talk about him from that really personal side is for those that are listening, pastors or otherwise, you need to have evangelist Ted Houston in your church. And I would love for you to get in contact. I'll give you that contact number one more time, the way you can text me, and I'll get you into contact with Brother Houston. 309, you can text me, 309-316-7240. And get in contact with us. He would love to be a help. He's a revivalist. and He helps churches that way. And so if you would, consider having evangelist Ted Houston in your, in your church. Um, he has been a great help to me. I would also ask this, though. Pray for him because, and I'll let Brother Haley talk about this a little bit more. He has struggled with some health things and cancer along the way, but he's remained faithful. And so, Brother Haley, talk about uh, what Brother Houston means to you and how he's been a help and hasn't overstepped his bounds as a seasoned man, allowing you to do the work that God has for you. Well, so a couple of things I would describe Brother Houston as, and, you know, I, and I don't mean to, you know, I know that, you know, it's all about the Lord, you know, it's. <laughs> We're not, man is, is just a tool that God uses, but it's, you're, I'm thankful for men that, that allow God to use them mm -hmm. and, and how, and their character and how they let God use them. And Brother Houston, I would describe his character. Uh, first of all, is humble. He's a very humble man. 
You know, it's, it's all about the Lord. It's not about his will. It's about God's will. And so when I first came, even though being a young man, he prayed about it as well. And he made it very clear if he didn't believe it was God's will, he wouldn't have voted yes either to allow me for the church, you know? And so, it, I mean, I'm very thankful for his humility to allow me to come pastor, even though, like I said, he's been the pastor. I think he's been a pastor actually 30 plus years. Oh, wow. You know, and so that made me very nervous too, coming in to preach. Like, oh man, I'm going to take over a church with a guy that's been in doing it for years. He's just going to rip me up. You know, like he's going to stare down my back and just be able to like, point out everything I do wrong. And he's not done that a single time. The only time he's ever given his opinion is if I've ever asked. That's, that's huge for me. You know, I just like, wow, that he would trust me or that he would even just allow me to make mistakes. And he's very submissive. I think that really is the key you know, to a good relationship between anybody in a church is submission to that authority. Yes, I'm a young man, but when you look at the Bible, the office of the pastor is a big deal, and it doesn't matter their age. It's the office that they hold, and we have to submit ourselves, just like for me. I'm a young dad, but my children have to submit themselves to me because I am their dad, and if our home is going to work, my wife has to submit. My children have to submit, and even though I make mistakes and I try to get back up and do better, uh, that submission is the key to making it function. It's the same way in the church. And he's been very submissive, you know, even where we just had a conversation the other day where he asked about preaching at a church. And if I, if uh, as, as his pastor, if that would be okay uh, for uh, just kind of the scenario that it was. And I was humbled that he'd even ask because a lot of evangelists probably wouldn't even ask their pastor. You know, I don't know. I was like, man, you know, you've been pastoring 30 plus years and call and ask my permission as your pastor but it's because he's submissive to the office and he knows that for god to bless him he's got to submit to his spiritual authority and that's where i'm at uh, as his spiritual authority which makes it a big responsibility on me to make sure that i am what i need to be because i don't want to hinder his ministry either right and so i need to be what god wants me to be and i need to be in prayer for him so that way he can be effective for the lord but can i tell you he is if for anybody that's out there have him come preach and just get to know his attitude and character because he has been the epitome of what a young pastor can you can need and use in a seasoned man of God in his church where I just, it's been such a blessing. You know, I, and I have a very personal relationship with him too, because he's been that way for me. I can call him anytime he picks up the phone. Uh, he calls me pastor. It's not, you know, Hey, rich, you know, it's, hey, pastor, how are you doing? Uh, praying for you. And I tell him, pray for him too, love him. And I ask him all kinds of questions. I mean, I, I all kinds of church questions. When I've had church problems, when I've had church questions, I call him. He takes that phone call anytime and is just very gracious to just allow me to, to plug, you know, just put in plugs of what, what do I do here? And, and, and what about this? What did you do? You know, and he'll tell me all the time, you know, what I did was not always the right way this is what I did. He goes, but if you do it different, I understand. Right. It's like, you know, it's huge because I don't, I, I'm, I'm not having to bear the weight of if I don't do this his way, is he going to leave my church? Mm -hmm. because he maybe would know better. And he's very gracious to allow me just the privilege to get to make my mistakes, make my decisions, do the things that I would, I, my, that's my personality, you know, how I would do things. Maybe they're not the way he would do them, but it's not wrong. It's just the way that I would do it. And he's just been so gracious to allow me to do that. And then whenever he comes to the church, you know, and I, I, I try to have him preach as often as I can. Uh, but, you know, sometimes I've preached when he's been here and he's just always encouraging, always coming up. That was a great message, Pastor. That, you know, and he, amen, you know, during the sermon, you know, the little things that are just like to a young man is encouraging to know, right. hey, the older men of God have my back. You know, yes, I'm not perfect. But he's been such a, a blessing to me. He does have cancer, um, and he he had it, got rid of it. It was in remission, and then it came back. And so he's been through the chemo process and all of that. And so I've gotten to watch also a seasoned man of God that's traveling like yourself, preaching in, in evangelism, uh, and yet stay faithful to the Lord, stay submissive to his pastor, be faithful to church when he's when he's here. You know, he's he's you know continuing to come, and he's still faithful. He doesn't you know just come back and sit and, and never come to church. I mean, when he's here, he's, he's faithful and he's even soul winning. I mean, he's like, if I'm here on a Saturday, I'm coming soul winning, you know, and he'll come and, and go out with me soul winning. He could just stay back and rest, but he, 
I don't know how he doesn't. I mean, that character is another, you know, he's a man of character. He needs to write a book uh, on character. Yes. Because, boy, he just, I mean, up early, up late, and he just gets it done and has been just a blessing, you know. And Amen. so on the flip side, every great man is a great wife. And that's where Mrs. Houston's come into play. She's been a huge blessing for my wife as well, you know, where Brother Houston's been a blessing to me. But having Mrs. Houston, she's here more than he is because of their schedule and how it works out. And so you can't mention Brother Houston without mentioning Mrs. Houston because she is a huge help being a pastor's wife of many years. She plays the piano for us. She she teaches in our patch classes. She will anywhere that I need somebody to do something, she's more than willing to do that. And so that's the other side where the Houston family is such a blessing that they are willing not only just to be in the church of a younger pastor, but help like, hey, we've been there. We've done it. What do you need? And, and they will they do it. And Miss Houston has been a, a huge blessing, you know, and, and, you know, and I don't, I don't want to say more than one or the other, but she's here more. And so she will, you know, she's a huge blessing in that she will, she'll just do anything that I, I ask her to do, you know, and brother Houston travels and preaches, but when she's here, uh, she will just jump in and help my wife and, and help me. And, and she, you know, has that spiritual mindset where we can ask her questions too. My wife can talk to her and have that kind of accountability as well to talk to somebody and, and just ask questions. So you, you just have both that it's just huge. And it's just been the epitome. If I ever retire as a man of God and help a younger pastor, I would want to be the way the Houston's have been to us and how that they've been uh, to, to, to me as a pastor. So. Amen. Amen. Can I, can I pause for just one second? My Someone's knocking on the uh, door here. One second. Amen. Hey, All right, we'll jump back in here first. Just a second. We'll wrap it up about seven minutes, if that's okay. Hey. So, uh, let's see where we're at. Um, let, me, uh, let me close that door so my, my kids aren't uh, making an appearance. All right, we'll jump back in. The one thing that I would tag along, two things. Number one, please pray for Evangelist Ted Houston. And number two is this, that I have never heard Brother Houston preach except for that I've been helped. And that's such a great blessing to me to know that this is a man that I can only trust to bring in and, and have had the opportunity to have him in multiple times. My dad's uh, jumping in here and uh, and listening in. But uh, I'm, I'm using his office right now. What's that? You need to interview that guy right there. Exactly, Alex, exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I, th I think we're going to get that done one of these days. But um, as, as far as Ted Houston goes, number one, pray for him. And number two, as I said, I've never heard him preach that I haven't been helped. And he's preached some of the most powerful messages I've ever heard. And as you said, he's done it just as a tool of God. And he, yeah. he doesn't take the acclaim for himself. And I so really appreciate that. Well, two quick things as we kind of wrap up here. Number one, talk about, in short, if you can, and I know that's difficult for an evangelist and a pastor, but talk about tracks and, of course, Bible tracks incorporated and how important they are to you. Of course, we're talking to an audience, many of them listening to the Bible track echoes radio broadcast been going out since 1958. They've heard a lot about tracks, but talk about for you personally, what do gospel tracks mean to you and how important are they? Gospel tracks are very special to me because I'm here as a result of a gospel track. So my grandma uh, is a, a born again Jew that you know raised in Morocco, uh, came uh, to the United States years later, met my grandpa who's a Catholic, and they got married on a blind date. And just a neat story there. But grandma eventually got saved, uh, and then as when she got saved because of some ladies down the road, uh, she didn't get a chance to get into a good church because grandpa being the army. Uh, they traveled all over the world. So she tried many different churches, just whatever that was there to offer. She just had a hunger for God. She didn't know what was the right, what was right. She just knew she was saved. She had found Jesus. And where do I go from here? So they moved to Colorado Springs, Colorado, 
and my grandpa knew that my grandma wanted to go to church. He didn't really care. He was a good Catholic. He went to church on Christmas and Easter, and that was that was his extent of church. But he knew grandma wanted to go to church, and so he found a track on the table at the at the army base where he cleaned, and he found the track on the table to the Cornerstone Baptist Church at Colorado Springs, Colorado, took it home, and just said, call them. Maybe they'll come pick you up. And so sure enough, grandma called Dr. D. Miller, and the next Sunday, my dad said somebody came by, picked them all up for church, and that was the beginning of them going to church there, growing in the Lord. They still go to that church, and now my grandpa even goes to the church, and that's wow. 40, 50 years later, he never would step foot in the door, uh, and finally, years later now, he even goes to that church, and so it's a blessing to see. So tracks are very important to me because I'm here as a result. I don't know if my grandma would have, you know, I, obviously, God's will, but, you know, would she have ever found that church? Would she have ever, you know, uh, gotten into a good church, ever grown in the Lord? Would my dad have ever gotten saved? Uh, would my dad would my dad have ever met my mom? All of that happened at that church. And so very important to me that what the effect that gospel tracks have. It doesn't take away the personal responsibility, of course, of witnessing, right. but it is a tool that God can use. And it's been a tool that God has used over and over and over. And what I always say about tools, if they're not broke, don't fix them. And so tracks are very important. I love gospel tracks, using them, laying them everywhere, because I want somebody, you know, one day years down the road to, to have the same story of a track that I left somewhere and say, hey, right. somebody left this, and I'm here today because of just a gospel track that had the gospel in it with a phone number, and, and here we are today. So very important to me, very special, because it's affected my family in such a big way. Just one small piece of paper. I mean, what does a track cost to print, you know, 25 cents? And my whole family is in church. My mom and dad met. Uh, we've gotten saved. All of my, uh, all of my dad's sisters got saved. They're all serving in churches. I mean, it's just been, it's just changed our whole family because somebody just took time to leave a gospel track at a table that they were at and say, you know, maybe somebody will pick this up. Now, who knows how many gospel tracks they had ever left in their life? But if no, if if their entire life only one gospel track made a difference it was it's worth it to me i'm on that end where one day when i get to heaven i want to ask the lord who left that gospel track <laughs> i want to thank who that was whoever left that gospel track there on that table so amen that's so great to hear and for those that are listening and wondering how much does a gospel track cost to print well by the math that we use we don't normally mention this too often but for the we we of course bible tracks incorporated we print the gospel tracks the paper and the ink all of that stuff the packaging to put them all together the shipping we take care of all of that and the only way we do that is by the grace of god and the generous giving of god's people but we're able to the highest number that it almost ever is and that's including the shipping and everything per track is less than 10 cents per track and wow. so that's getting it to you that's in your hands that's folded that's ready to go and but again the only way we can do that is by the fact that god has allowed this ministry to go on for 80 plus years and by people just like you that have partnered with us and so we're, we're so very thankful for people that invest in our ministry and I, if i can say it this way invest in eternity that way we use your money for the cause of the kingdom not for our own personal benefit and of course, by the by, the government standards, we're a nonprofit, but we are that way as a ministry. Our goal is to see people save, not accrue riches to ourselves. And I'm going to leave the last question I have for time's sake. I think maybe Brother Haley, sometime in the future, and as the Lord kind of solidifies even more so what God's going to do through your ministry and through the church there in this coming year, maybe we'll need to revisit this question of big vision and allowing God to use you that way. So we'll revisit that in the coming days, and I hope. Those of you that have been listening to this program today have been blessed by it. And again, I'll say it one more time. If you'd like to get in contact with me, or maybe you have a question for Brother Haley, or maybe just maybe you're listening from somewhere that's close to the Wichita area and you're looking for a good church. Well, Amazing Grace Baptist Church would be a great place, not only to accept Christ as your Savior, if you haven't done that, but also get grounded. And I appreciate Brother Haley's heart. We were talking yesterday for about three hours over lunch and the opportunity to speak to your church. People had a great time there. But the emphasis that you have on grounding people in spiritual truth and them growing and not just subsisting on the milk of the word, but on the meat of the word. And so I'll let you, Brother Haley, sign off. If there is there any last words you would have for the listeners? No, I just encourage everybody, you know, uh, to, you know, of course, if you've not accepted Christ, uh, that's the most important decision, no matter what area of life that you're at. Uh, you know, if you, if you have questions, you know, to get a hold of somebody that uh, get a hold of Brother Micah here, or if you're around this area myself, 
because God wants you to most importantly settle eternity. That that's something that is you don't put off. You know, we look at the days around us. We know the the coming of the Lord can't be can't be far away, and that's just it's a scary thought. You know, it's a it's an exciting thought, but a scary thought as well. And then for those that you are saved, don't waste time. Get into a good church. Let God use you. Uh, you know, no matter that your age, don't let your age stop you. You know, let God uh, be willing to let God use you because I believe the Lord wants to do a great work. He just needs people that are willing to let him do it. And that's just really, that's, that's just the extent of it. If we can get young people just to say, Hey God, I'll, I'll just do whatever. Uh, I think we could turn the world upside down. Amen. Well, greatly appreciate your time today. And to our listeners, thank you so much. Once again, that cell phone number, you can text me directly 309 309- 316-7240. Especially if you're in the Wichita area, I love to get you in contact with Pastor Haley. You could also just Google Amazing Grace Baptist Church and uh, 309-316-7240. Well, thank you so much, sir. Greatly appreciate your time today. To our listeners, we'll talk to you all soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye-bye.